Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so now over to our next speaker, Barbara Heaton. Thanks, Mike. Um, can everybody hear me at the back? Yes? Great. Okay. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different approach to the last two speakers. Um, my background is not in criminal law, and my first degree was not in law either. It was in English literature. So what I want to do is to draw your attention to the actual language that is being used uh, to talk about rape and sex crime these days, and to invite you to see it uh, not as neutral, um, but as a particular type of rhetoric. And when you hear um, rape discussed, to um, invite yourselves to think about why people discussing it are using the terms that they do. Uh, now, why is rape different? Um, yes, well, you've heard two, two, two competing arguments about the crime. Um, it's worth remembering that the well-known feminist commentator Germaine Greer has strenuously advocated the idea that rape should not be seen as different, that it is an assault on the person like other categories of assault. Uh, and she, in 2006, advanced the down-to-earth argument that the crime of rape should be abolished and it should be replaced with a downgraded offence of common assault with a sexual component. Um, and she argued also that um, crimes of mutilation against children should be treated far more severely than, um, if you like, your common or garden rape of a female adult. Um, so she's been an outspoken person who's challenged the prevailing consensus about rape as a uniquely heinous and appalling crime. Um, and she has also argued that complainants should not expect anonymity and that if they are trying to um, accuse someone of an offence which can result in their loss of liberty, they should be prepared to turn up in court, look that person in the eye and give their evidence in exactly the same way as accusers in other types of criminal prosecution. So why do we have these two competing views? Um, I'm suggesting to you that this is part of a, a, a much older debate about equality and difference. Um, in the 19th century, when women campaigned for equality, what they were looking for was political equality, um, to be treated in the same way as men and to have access to the same opportunities as men. They weren't asking to be treated differently. Um, however, they appropriated, in many ways, um, language about sexuality and ideas of sexual behaviour, which come from older historical roots. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to the social purity movement, which was very active in the 19th century and which had a lot to say about sex crime, prostitution and enforced um, sexual uh, slavery, as we would call it now. And this was very heavily influenced by the Christian revivalist movement. Uh, one of the most outstanding feminist campaigners, Josephine Butler, who campaigned against prostitution, uh, was a fervent feminist, but also a fervent Christian. Uh, and prostitution for these campaigners was distasteful because it was also immoral. Uh, women who engaged in prostitution were not just unfortunate, but they were fallen and they needed to be saved. And in the 19th century, you see the start of what nowadays we would call the rescue industry. Um, and they use exactly the same language that we hear used now. They talk of trafficking, they talk of enforced um, prostitution. Uh, they were very concerned with the problem of young girls as they saw it involved in, in prostitution. Uh, and they were very strongly against the idea of state regulation of prostitution because at the time the Contagious Diseases Act enabled the police to um, accuse women of being prostitutes with the result that they were subject to an enforced examination to see whether or not they had a sexually transmitted disease, which Josephine Butler characterised as surgical rape. Uh, in the 1880s, there was an outstanding moral panic created by a newspaper called The Maiden Tribute of Modern Babylon, which I suggest to you has direct um, overtones for the way we talk about sex crime today. Uh, and it was a scandal about underage girls in the sex trade. It was described in the most lurid terms. Uh, it was described as women being ruined. Um, they were maidens this morning, but tonight their ruin will be accomplished. Um, they will be destroyed. Um, the newspaper editor, who was a fervent Christian himself, um, suggested that he might be able to shake the conscience of some nice people out there, um, but he cynically suggested that most people couldn't give a toss. Uh, and he said, London's lust annually uses up many thousands of women who are literally killed and made away with, living sacrifices slain in the service of vice. So he uses very lurid language to describe the sex trade. Um, and, um, 
very titillating accounts of flogging and rape in padded rooms, articles entitled things like Why the Cries of Victims Are Not Heard, um, and created a huge moral panic, which led to the um, increase in the age of consent for girls from 13 to 16, but also greatly increased regulation of street walking and prostitution, um, and also criminalised indecency between men. So, um, what that led to um, is the idea that in order to protect women, you lead to a situation where you have greater regulation and you also have a portrayal of women as inherently vulnerable. Uh, and it's perhaps no accident that this occurred at a time when there was a lot of anxiety about female independence. More and more women were coming into the urban areas seeking to work independently. Some of them were exposed to the risk of prostitution uh, and that led to a countervailing argument that they were, they were in danger and that freedom was dangerous. Um, and that led to, if you like, the idea that um, women needed to be protected from this kind of thing um, and that they were inherently fragile and vulnerable. And we still hear this rhetoric of vulnerability used today. Um, moving forward, the next rhetoric which is introduced, which is very powerful around sex crime, is that of the 1970s and 80s feminists who were very vocal about the idea that rape was minimised, that sexual abuse was much more widespread in society than people were prepared to acknowledge. Um, and again, they use this very dramatic idea of um, women being subjected to appalling abuses behind closed doors. And again, they use this idea of um, enslavement. Um, they treated women subjected to sex crimes as victims on a par with those who were victims of torturers or Nazi um, abusers. Um, and they developed this idea of the victim, um, which views women as if you like, enslaved by the patriarchal society. Um, child girls are groomed by sexual abuse for a lifetime of sexual subjugation to men, and when they grow up they will be married and they will be beaten and raped. Now this is very extreme, um, but it's typical of a type of rhetoric which again harks back to Christian revivalism in the 19th century, which is all about the world is very wicked and cruel, it's also evil, um, if, you, if you wake up and hear the truth, you can be saved. If not, it's going to be terrible. Um, and what you had were these first-person testimon testimonies, which were repeatedly um, propagated about terrible abuse that was happening to women. Um, and this caused, if you like, a very powerful movement um, where the idea that sexual abuse was seen as widespread became more and more acceptable. It was taken up by psychotherapists, it was taken up by campaigners. Um, People started to write self-help books like The Courage to Heal, published in 1998. Very influential book, written not by a psychotherapist or a psychologist or a criminologist, but by two students of creative writing, who became convinced as they um, had workshops with students writing stories, that what the students were really writing about was repressed sexual abuse. And they wrote this book called The Courage to Heal, which famously said, if you are unable to remember any specific instances of abuse, but still have a feeling that something abusive happened to you, it probably did. Uh, and that actually led to a whole outbreak of people thinking that they'd been abused in childhood, making accusations against parents, lawsuits, prosecutions, and um, consequent miscarriages of justice. Um, but this idea that you should believe the victim unquestioningly, and that if someone says something happened to me, it has done, or it probably has done, has been enormously influential. Um, to a point now where I think we, we have virtually an ideology, and this is certainly how the sociologist Joel Best has described it, um, an ideology of sexual victimisation, which dominates current thinking. Uh, and it really has four components. The first is the idea that rape and sexual abuse are very widespread but largely unrecognised, even by victims themselves who need to be taught to recognise what's really happened. Secondly, that it has long-term damaging effects. Thirdly, that it's morally absolutely unambiguous. The victim is utterly innocent, the victimizer is utterly guilty, and this is incontestable. And then finally, claims of victimization must always be respected, anything less is victim blaming. Um, and this, I think, this explanation that Best gives is, it explains why we talk about rape in the way that we do at the moment and why anyone who, who questions it in any way at all is immediately accused of being either victim blaming or a rape apologist. Um, but it is a problematic discourse. 
I mean, first, the idea that sexual abuse is widespread, I think, is highly debatable. Um, in America, when the Courage to Heal came out, they were insisting that one in three women was sexually abused, which, if true, would imply a crime wave of absolutely epidemic proportions, which actually the system couldn't possibly deal with. Um, secondly, it is very, very um, reductionist, arguably, in its assumption that sexual abuse causes lifelong damage, and it's responsible for a whole host of other problems, depression, doing badly at school, not being able to succeed in, in, in a marriage, not being able to succeed in your career. It becomes the cause of everything that goes wrong in life. Um, and then finally, and I think that... Mike, how am I doing for time? Um, if you could wrap up. OK. Um, what I want you to do is to think very hard about the rhetoric that you hear and think about where it comes from, why we talk about rape in the way that we do. Uh, and finally, in answer to the question, is rape different? My view is that we have actually problematised rape to a point where actually we need to start turning the clock back. I don't think this is a bad thing, as Jennifer is suggesting. I think it's a good thing, because we, we now know why we want to turn the clock back. Um, because the way in which we think about rape at the moment, actually, in my opinion, has potentially more damaging consequences than it has uh, positive advantages. Thank you.